What would you say that a preacher had taught if, as I did this morning, were to come into the pulpit, look out at you for a little bit, say not a word, and then come down out of the pulpit, ocean to the song leader to sing a song of invitation. After the services, someone might ask you, what did the preacher teach this morning? And you'd say, well, I don't know why. <laughs> Unless you'd ask and I told you. <laughs> but he was silent. So he had no message. There was nothing he communicated to us. I want to talk about this morning the silence of the scriptures. The silence of the scriptures. The religious world in general, and among brethren in particular, there are those who have spread the false doctrine that you can prove anything by the Bible. And that false notion has arisen to some extent because of what the Bible does not say. And some, of course, hold to the idea that it's impossible for us to understand the truth as it's presented in the Scriptures. But that it's not what the Bible teaches. To me, because you have a book like the Bible that is a book to communicate to man in words, I don't have to say any more than that to say, if you believe it to be the Word of God, that God has something to say to us. And He thinks it's so important that He gave us a book. Sometimes on Facebook, there's a cartoon that will appear and he has somebody looking up the clouds saying, God, speak to me, and a hand coming down with the Bible. He has spoken. He has spoken. It's in his word. It's right there. You can read it. The Bible can be understood. How could God place our salvation upon that which is written and then give us that which is written Knowing all the time we couldn't understand it. And even have in that Bible many, many places. Study the words, understand the words, learn your duty to God. Basically that's what so many passages say. It would mean a passage like 2 Timothy 2.15 makes no sense whatsoever. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's interesting, but the word itself, understand, occurs some 300 times in the Bible. And here's what Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit, said to the church in Ephesus, and so to all of us. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he wrote earlier in chapter 3, verse 4, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, if you can prove anything by the Bible, that doesn't make any sense at all. It, but it's amazing how people fall for such things. And I suggest to you they fall for it because they're looking for anything they can to justify them in not learning what the Bible says. But is it not strange that people will read into a text what the words don't have in that text. So now back to my illustration, if I got up here as a preacher and I stood here and looked at you and then got down and somebody said, what did he preach on? You see, according to some people, you could say he preached on anything <laughs> because it's left up to you to determine whatever it is for. I would have given you nothing. But nothing, it seems, is what a lot of people want. The definition, by the way, of nothing is not one thing. So I would have given you not one thing. But my silence would have authorized you to believe anything. And that's the problem. 
I would like for us to study the scriptures in order to respect its silence. We'll get around to this a little more later, but we'll use this as a text. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. I'll let that settle in. We'll get to it a little bit later. The Old Testament gives emphasis to the silence of the Scriptures. Notice what we have in the case of Nadab and Abihu. Scripture reads in Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Strange fire was that which was not authorized, which God had not commanded. There was no word of God for using that fire that they used. Now these things being written aforetime for our learning, Romans 15, 4, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures... Not the silence of the scriptures, but through patience come to the scriptures, what these scriptures in words say might have hope. What do I learn from this? You do not act without the word of God telling you to act. Colossians 3.17 is the reason we use it so much. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father by him. When you come down to Joshua 6, 10 and 20, and Israel's going over to possess the land of Canaan, the instructions were to the army of Israel, the people of Israel, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. So the people shouted. This goes on a little later. And the priest blew the trumpets. It came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet that the people shouted with a great shout. And the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. That was Jericho, of course. Notice how the Lord said, don't shout until I tell you to shout. Now how were they to know when they were shouting? When he told them to shout, when he authorized them to shout, when the word communicated that message to them, they acted according to the authority of God. Now what would you think would have happened to them if they'd shouted before the Lord told them to? Well, we certainly know what happened when somebody violated taking stuff out of the city that God said, don't take it. It cost him, Achan, his life and his family's life and everything he had because they did that which was not commanded. Well, you do that which is not commanded when you have no authority from God to act, but you act anyway. Now, the New Testament continues this emphasis. And now we're back to Hebrews 7, 4. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, which tribe Moses spake nothing, not one thing, concerning priesthood. Well, we all know the priest came from the tribe of Levi. But under the New Testament, Christ is a priest. The point being made by the writer is that he couldn't be a priest if the law of Moses is yet binding. Because the law of Moses did not say anything about a priest coming from any tribe but what? Tribe of Levi. And the Lord came to the tribe of Judah. So the law was still binding. He couldn't be a priest. But he is a priest. So the law is not binding any longer. And thus, that's the point made by the inspired writer of the Hebrews. To show the people they don't need to go back to the law of Moses they have a much better way in the New Testament of Christ. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, 
that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Speaking as an oracle of God means you've got to have an oracle from God. You've got to have a message from God. You have to have the word of God before you can speak it. You don't dwell on the silence. So it's no wonder that when people in the early 19th century, and a little earlier than that actually, began to try to have the church as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, that they said, well, we need the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. And it was Thomas Campbell who said, we speak where the Bible speaks, we're silent where the Bible is silent. Well, when you take what we've studied already, you see that he did not originate something that came out of his mind or any other human's mind. He just put it in modern day English vernacular and said, speak as the word of God guides you to speak. That's what Peter was saying in 1 Peter 4.11. So we need to study the scriptures. We need to listen to the words. The words present the will of Christ. We learn the will of Christ by the words of Christ. Thus the admonition to study, to show ourselves to prove to God. We can't study the silence except to note it. <laughs> We're looking for authority from God to believe and act. So we do that and we can learn the straight and narrow way that leads from earth to heaven. It's all bound up in the meaning of the scriptures and the right division of the word. Now for a moment I'm going to go back over some things some of us have studied but won't hurt to be reminded of them. The scriptures authorized by a direct statement. Simple one is Acts 2.38. It's imperative order that is given by Peter to those who by his preaching and the other apostles' preaching had been persuaded to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, their Messiah, and that they had taken him by wicked hands and crucified and slain him. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he said to those who believed in Christ, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a direct statement. I know what a believer ought to do from that statement in order to have sins remitted. It's directly stated. So there's one way words authorize anybody to act. Then there's implication. When you look at Philip's preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, I'm thinking now of where Peter went back over that incident in first, uh, uh, Acts chapter 11. When he preached to him, he says, it preached unto him Jesus. Now, no person with any gumption whatsoever, and gumption means any good sense at all, would say that Philip just stood in that chariot and began at the same scripture in Isaiah 53, just looked at him and said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And as soon as he got through saying Jesus, then the uh, eunuch said, See, here's water. What does it hinder me to be baptized? <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense at all. But i tell you what does make sense is that when he preached to him Jesus, that's the same as saying he preached to him the gospel or the faith or the New Testament system of salvation. And in the process of preaching Jesus, he preached what Jesus said one must do in order to be saved from sins. And that's the reason he interrupted, as did those Pentecostians, and said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And, of course, he was told, If thou believest all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they stopped the chariot. They both went down the water. Philip baptized him and so on. So we need to learn then that there's something else comes up about the scriptures, and that's called a synecdoche, where a part stands for the whole or a whole for the part. And here Jesus stood for the whole gospel the man needed to hear. And that's why he wanted to be baptized without baptism being explicitly stated. Because you cannot preach Jesus like Philip did and not preach the way Jesus said one must believe and do to be saved. And it was Jesus who said, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, how did the eunuch understand that? I'm ready. Stop the chariot. Here's water deep enough to bury me, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12. I'm ready. Is there anything hindering me? Yeah, you've got to confess Christ. Confess what? That you believe in Christ. And he did. 
and he's qualified to be baptized. So there's implication. The information put together, reason from, brings you to that conclusion. Then there's examples, such as in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and 25, where Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper and correcting problems with their observance of the Lord's Supper there in the church of Corinth. And we're instructed there by example to observe it on the first day of every week in the worship assembly of the saints, Acts 20 and 7. Now we have in Acts 20 and 7 the account of an action. The account of an action of a church. What's interesting about it is that an apostle is there, and he's the apostle that first brought the message to them, and he's there at the time that uh, they assemble, and they assemble on the first day of the week. They're doing what the Lord authorized them to do. And we see that the Lord's Supper was observed in that worship assembly. Now, it was observed in an upper chamber with many lights, so it was at night, or at least we assume it was for him preaching until midnight. I think that's at night. And what happens? Well, do we say the Lord's Supper is authorized only to be partaken of in an upper chamber where there are many lights at night? No, that's incidental to the thing commanded. Jesus has already authorized that they partake of that Lord's Supper in the kingdom. But he nowhere tells you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that it was on the first day of the week. Well, now we have an apostolic precedent. Because Paul certainly taught them when to observe the Lord's Supper and how. And he's there with them doing what he taught them. In fact, he waited for several days. And he was in a big hurry to get to Jerusalem for the church to come together on the first day of the week. And they came together to break bread. And break bread itself is a synecdoche for at least the whole of the Lord's Supper. And I think for the whole of the worship of the church on the first day of the week. Thus, the upper chamber, the many lights at night and so on is binding only in the sense that I'm permitted to do that. But the place is incidental. But the thing that God authorized to be done that's imperative is the observance of the Lord's Supper in the worship assembly of the saints. That is set out by example, and we're authorized by an example, because that account of that action becomes an example, a pattern for us to follow, because it has apostolic precedent. They were taught that way and were doing what Paul taught them and he knew it and he waited to be with them and engaged in it with them. Further, we've got to recognize the difference between explicit statements. An explicit statement just to, in so many words it says something. Everything the Bible teaches, it teaches, it teaches explicitly or implicitly. It doesn't teach any other way. If you were trying to say, well, the Bible is binding upon me today, especially the New Testament of Christ. How do you know that? How would you show that you as an individual, and put your name there, must obey the Scriptures? As far as I know, my name and address and Social Security number <laughs> is not saying this Bible's for David, Brown, etc. How do I know it is for me? Well, there's certain scriptures like 2 Timothy 2, 2, the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, these same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And Jesus said in Matthew 28 that uh, you're to teach those who are baptized. Well, when you continue the process, then every member of the church and all that the New Testament says a member of the church is, is to teach others. And so the teaching goes on. There's my authority to abide today under the authority of the New Testament. If you consider Saul of Tarsus and the plan of salvation... He heard the instructions of Christ telling him where to go. And, of course, Christ had appeared to Ananias, the gospel preacher, and he told him to go to where Paul was or Saul was, Acts 9, 4, and the verses following, and another account in chapter 22, 13 through, 16, 13 through 16. And we see, obviously, that Saul had believed in Jesus, 9, 6, Acts 9, 6, in chapter 22, 10. It's obvious also that Saul of Tarsus had repented of his sins. He did, I know that because of the way he's acting. 
It's the acts of a repentant man. Acts 17.30 I know that he confessed that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. Acts 9.6.22.10 Romans 10, 9 and 10. And I know he was baptized, Acts 22, 16. Chapter 9, verse 18. Paul himself wrote about baptism in Romans 6, 3 and 4. Now you can't read of Saul of Tarsus explicitly in just so many words doing all of those things. Can some of them? Well, not all of them. Well, then how do I know that he did that? Because I know what the rest of the Bible teaches, one must believe and do in order to become a Christian. And he became a Christian. Therefore, he did whatever was necessary that God commanded him to become a Christian. Which meant he repented of his sins. And I often say that you cannot find anywhere in the New Testament in just so many words that Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented of his sins. It's not there. Yet I know by implication that he did because you can't become a Christian without repenting of your sins. Did Paul become a Christian? Yes. So what must he have done regarding repentance? He had to repent of his sins. Then there are implicit statements. And we've actually touched on that in talking about the explicit statements of uh, Paul. And that's what we're emphasizing. In the latter part of what I just said are the M implicit statements when an action or fact is absolutely demanded according to the Bible without being specifically stated then that action or fact is a matter of implication and that's a situation when you consider Saul of Tarsus conversion now the significance of the silence of the scriptures we can discuss what is written well, we can't discuss silence. Can't do it. Well, what did he say on the matter? He remained silent on the matter. What does he teach on this subject? He remained silent on that subject. And so on and so forth. We need to observe this. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in the law, uh, father in law, and the, uh, the priest of Midian. Of course, they're still in the patriarchy. <clears throat> and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to hold him. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame, a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Exodus 3, 1 through 3. Question. What kind of bush was that? Nobody knows. How big was the bush? You know, there are different sized bushes. Even in a general way, you know when a bush is not a tree. Yeah, I didn't realize those are general, generic terms, but at the same time, there's a reason he said bush and not a tree. And without going back to the original language, I still ask you, what kind of bush was it? And if you go to the original language, you can still ask that question and you won't have the answer. <laughs> then we talked about in our study of John, John 3, 1 through 2, about Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. Why did he come by night? Nobody knows. What hour of the night was it? 7 o'clock? 10 o'clock? Nobody knows. We have to be content with saying, I don't know. What color eyes did Jesus have? What color was his hair? What color was his skin? What did his voice sound like? How tall was he? How much did he weigh? Now, the only thing anybody can say is, I don't know. I don't know. Why? It's not revealed to us. John 8, verse 6, concerning Jesus. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. What did Jesus write on the ground? Which finger did he use to write on the ground? 
Have you ever been studying with somebody and they raise these kind of questions when you're in the midst of trying to figure out uh, there, or you're trying to teach them what to do to be saved from sin and they're worried about what finger the Lord used to write on the ground. When you've got somebody like that, that is a very strong indicator that they're not really interested. But it's also an opportunity where they're interested not to show them we don't know because the revelation hasn't given it to us. And we're to go according to the words revealed by God. Paul stated, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Again, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Now, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? How long had it been there? I don't know. Nobody else does. It is... Vain speculation to deal with the silence of the scriptures and trying to figure those things out. Oh, your curiosity may say that. I'd like to know a lot of things about Paul when you leave him at the end of the book of Acts in his own hired house teaching people that came to him, and then we don't know what happened after that. We don't have any record of when he was set free that we think he was set free, and he went on about doing whatever. I would say simply this. I know Paul did what he did before he was in before he was in prison. So he did what he was doing before he was in prison after he got out. I think you can safely say that. Then there's a law of inclusion and exclusion as examples. Every one of us goes somewhere when we order meals and we expect them uh, to be delivered as ordered. They don't just come up to you and look at you and say, well, I can tell by the fact you're sitting there looking at me and looking so sweet that you want this, 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 this. Now, people will do that in religion, but they wouldn't do that when it comes to chicken fried steak. <laughs> so we understand that what we order is done by words that tell the person taking our order what we want according to the menu. And what is excluded is what we didn't authorize. What is excluded is what there's no word from me to the one taking my order. But that's what I want. And I've seen people many times get the wrong order. You know, somebody doesn't like mayonnaise and they got their hamburger and had mayonnaise on it and they just have a fit. But when it comes to the word of God and going to heaven or hell, I, do you please? After all. Nobody can enjoy a hamburger alike. <laughs> Nobody can understand the Bible alike. Of course, you look back to the Old Testament, Genesis 6, 14, where Noah was commanded to make an ark of gopher wood. What was included? What the words authorized. And everything else that wasn't authorized was excluded. Now, if he had said gopher wood and pine, gopher wood and pine would have been included. If he said gopher wood, pine, and oak, then gopher wood, pine, and oak would have been included. And everything else rejected, but he didn't. His words are limited to one kind of wood, and he specified the wood, and it was gopher wood. And whether we understand what it is or not, he did. And so you have strange, unauthorized, uncommanded fire of Nadab and Abihu. Their sacrifice. demanded that they pay attention to what God had included in that sacrifice and even the fire that burned it. It was strange to God if you used something He didn't tell you to use. And that's the way it's described. And what they offered was not set out of the Word of God, and they died for it. And I don't, do you know of any other way that, that God could get over to people any more profoundly and pointedly that you do only what I tell you to do. And my what I tell you to do is in the words. And you must understand how I comment, how I authorize in my words. And you must give diligence to understand my words. God kills people for not doing things like He said. And God is love. What about unleavened bread and fruit of the vine and the Lord's Supper? Matthew 26, 26, and 28 has that in it. The law of inclusion included the bread. 
representing the body and the fruit of the vine, representing the blood of Christ, shows forth his death that he comes again. <coughs> Everything else is that clearly because it's not authorized. Same thing's true of mechanical instrument of music and worship or any other kind of music other than singing. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Colossians 3, 16. <coughs> Singing includes psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. They're sung by making melody in the heart to the Lord. It excluded all other music of any kind by all other types of songs. Why? Because those other, that other music and other types of songs are not authorized by the Word of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, what are the oracles of God? Include those things. <clears throat> the law of inclusion, if it's authorized, it's included. The law of exclusion, if it's not authorized, it's excluded. Seems rather simple to me, especially when you can see it on the simple level of when you order a hamburger and you don't get what you want. Why didn't you get what you want when you told them what you wanted? They can say, well, anybody can understand that anyway. Come to any conclusion, you can teach anything by our menu, and you can teach anything what you told me, and so I just gave you anything that suited me. Well, people wouldn't tolerate that, and they don't. The point is, we come down to this. If we reject God's Word, then He's going to reject us. If a man operates outside the realm of that which is authorized, he is going to be rejected by God. Only when men trust and obey what God says will God bless that one. So, is there authority in biblical silence? The Old, answer, the Old Testament answers no. The New Testament answers no. Therefore, the whole Bible answers with an astounding and resounding no. The silence of the Bible authorizes not one thing. We studied this morning this lesson, what to do to become a Christian. What God said. We studied what one must do on several things concerning how we determine his will and worship and other matters. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to obey that gospel. The power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16, as we studied. As a child of God, if you sin, we urge you to repent and confess your sins. Pray God for forgiveness. We have this time in which we encourage you to make things right with God in obedience to the truth while we stand and while we sing.